You are having a moment. Uh, look, uh, CNN's calling you the hottest candidate in this race. Scarborough, after you came on his show, uh, basically compared you to Barack Obama himself. How does it feel? I mean, three weeks ago, uh, almost nobody knew who you were outside of Indiana, and now people are beginning to uh, come around. How does that feel? Oh, it feels great. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm trying not to let it go to my head because, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm the same person I was three weeks ago. And yeah. more importantly, I need to make sure I stay the same person for, yeah. the, for the road ahead. But uh, it's reassuring to know that when we get our message in front of people, uh, they respond. People are excited about the idea of generational change. They're excited about uh, a new vocabulary for Democrats in defending our values. And, you know, whether we're in the early states or whether we're making the rounds in the media, uh, just seeing that powerful response has been uh, so motivating and so reassuring. Did, did it show up in the, in the fundraising? Did it show up in crowd size? I mean, how is it, how, is it getting to you? Do, you? do you know that something's changing? Can you feel it? Oh, yeah, you can definitely. I can't explain it. Well, first of all, you know, uh, just as I travel, more and more people are coming up to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, often when people know you're running for office, they, they come up to you and they talk about themselves. They talk about their stories and uh, what it means to them. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's just gone through the roof. The fundraising is great. We could always use more if yeah. anybody feels motivated <laughs> to go to p4america.com and lend a hand. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's been picking up. And more than anything, there's just this, I don't know, this intangible energy that you can just feel yeah. uh, when I walk into a room. This is a generationally different campaign in that there's so many people running. And people, they have a big moment and then they just go down. Are you scared a little bit? I mean, you know, a few weeks ago, somebody else was the flavor of the month. Are you scared right. that when you announce, you might then get the piñata treatment? Yeah, I mean, definitely the, the better you're doing, the more people are going to decide to take you down a peg. But that, that's just politics. That's how it works. And you shouldn't be in this field unless you're ready to defend your record and explain your values. Uh, I think really the way you survive the flavor of the month period, or with 20 of us, is probably a flavor of the week period. Um, but the way you do it is through substance. Uh, you got to make sure that you're putting forward something uh, that others aren't, or at least that, that you've got a fresh and different vocabulary that can reach people who maybe have tuned us out. I'm really worried, especially coming from the industrial Midwest, uh, that our party has trouble reaching people who actually believe in our values. They just haven't heard from us in a while. And I think coming from that part of the country, as well as the generational background that I have, and the background of being a mayor, which just puts you in a different headspace, I think, mm -hmm. than if you go to work in Washington every day, uh, I think that that just might create a, a way to reach people differently, mm -hmm. even if the values are pretty consistent among all of us who are looking at this race. Well, it, it, it is interesting because you're talking about that industrial heartland, some of the people who may not feel as comfortable with the Democratic Party, yet some of our candidates, like yourself, uh, like Beto, uh, like uh, Biden, uh, they continue to almost have to apologize. Bloomberg says that all the white guys are on an apology tour uh, <laughs> because of this kind of a, a demographic challenge inside the party. Do you think it's tough to be a white guy in our party reaching out to those uh, Midwestern uh, industrial voters at the same time uh, the base of our party looks very different? I think uh, what can create a problem is if we think we've got to choose one or the other. I mean, if, if reaching out to white working class voters has to mean walking away from our commitments on racial and social mm -hmm. justice, we shouldn't even be here. We have to be able to build a coalition that knits these forces together. Um, you know, I, I, I agree, but it's, it's just easier said than done. I mean, and it seems like the, the tripwire is so easy to, to set off. I mean, you're going to have to apologize for white privilege at some point. I mean, how, how are you going to handle... Uh, doing what you just said needs to get done. Well, in some ways, if you're a white candidate, you need to be thinking and talking about things like white privilege. It's, uh, I don't know that it's an apology tour. It's an honest engagement in good faith among people who have had radically different experiences but largely shared interests. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to use identity as a basis of solidarity. Right? right now, identity as a means of division is being mastered by this White House. We're at a moment of peak white identity politics. Uh, and it's being used to divide us across the working and middle class, uh, to divide us regionally, to divide us on partisan lines. Uh, it's never going to be easier. It's always easier to use political rhetoric to make people feel small and afraid uh, and, uh, and less kind toward others. It's harder to use political rhetoric to make people feel big-hearted and secure uh, and forward-looking. But it can be done, and, and that's one of the reasons to get into this in the first place. And is that why you is it because of all the division that you saw that you felt like even at such a young age you need to get out there? Yeah, it's, it's not like I, I grew up thinking, all right, I'm going to wait till I get to 37, then like, boom, <laughs> right? Um, it, it's more that the, we're a moment that I think calls for something completely different. 
And I think you can tell that by the fact that there are so many of us. The fact that you got somewhere between 20 and 10 and 20 people looking at this, and no one's been able to command even a, a decisive plurality. I think it tells you that, that voters in the party and in the country are looking for something completely different. And in many ways, for that reason, uh, I think the generational piece is an advantage. Uh, we've got a lot of leadership. You know, I'd be 39 uh, in, at, at inauguration. That's the same age as the president of France. I think that's slightly older than, uh, than the prime minister of New Zealand, who's, who's just become uh, on the world stage, just a remarkable leader. Uh, so I think it's, it's less a question of are you old enough, and it's more a question of what do you have to say. Another question I think a lot of people have been trying to answer is the, the VP question. Uh, do you feel like it's important to have a woman, for instance, as your VP or a person of color as your VP? How do you, how do you deal with that as we try to get all the excitements together and all the change together? Yeah, I think it's a healthy conversation to have. I would feel presumptuous saying anything about who my VP would be before we're you know, anywhere near the nomination. <laughs> before you've announced um, the president. <laughs> but I do think what we know is that our party needs to be, and our country, uh, needs to be led by faces that reflect its diversity. And that includes gender diversity, racial diversity. Our ticket should reflect that. Our leadership more broadly should reflect that. We've worked very hard to establish that in my administration back home. We're working on building a campaign team that reflects that. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's fair game to ask anybody yeah. who wants to lead a ticket, especially if they turn out to be white and male. Yeah, yeah, good. You know, you are, we're, we're in the situation now where I think the Democrats have always wanted to see ourselves, we are the party of inclusion, et cetera, maybe saying the Republicans are not, but now this question around uh, anti-Jewish sentiment yeah. has hit the front pages. And you had uh, Donald Trump saying that the Democrats are actually an anti-Jewish party. So the president is, I think, using, as he often does, uh, these kinds of uh, divisions and, and stereotypes in order to break our coalition. Uh, look, it's not like the president cares about anti-Semitism. This is somebody who literally uh, couldn't even condemn like straight up, outright, Jews will not replace us, neo-Nazis. Uh, let's not take his cue. Uh, on issues like anti-Semitism. But, but, but he, he does have a Jewish daughter, he has a Jewish son-in-law, and he's got Jewish grandkids. So I, I think uh, when he speaks out about it, he does have some uh, gr ground to stand on. I don't know, that sounds like I have a lot of back, black friends. Like, <laughs> okay, okay but, but, <laughs> but you're still making an excuse for neo-Nazis. Like, you know, so, this is, but this isn't about him. This is about us. And we need to find a way in this country to debate uh, policies in Israel, um, to recognize that supporting Israel can still include being critical of the Israeli right wing. But also, we absolutely have to make sure that it never slides into these anti-Semitic stereotypes, things that echo some of the worst of what we've seen. And being held accountable for that is a healthy thing. You are a small town mayor in a red state, and people voted for Trump and you right. uh, in your town. What do you know about Trump voters that the rest of us don't know that you're able to see through some of this crazy stuff and still, still appeal to them? Well, I think there's a sense of hostility to the system, uh, to the economic and political system that we live in. And that part uh, of what's motivated some of these voters is not wrong. Now, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not making any excuse for some of the explicit appeals to racism that were made and in some cases worked. But at the same time, we've also got to recognize that if we come off, if he's saying the system's rigged, and the way he's saying it is twisted, not really true, but, but there's a kernel of truth in there. And we look like we're the ones saying, oh no, the system is perfectly fine. Then we got a problem. And Democrats are already, I think, experiencing this temptation to say, uh, first, uh, you know, this is chaos, the, the White House is chaotic, we can't go on like this, it's tearing us apart. That part's true. But then second part that, that is tempting is to say, therefore, let's go back. Let's, let's go back to normal. The problem is normal wasn't working for a lot of people. Over decades, when Republican and Democratic presidents have let us down, and Democrats can't take it back to the 90s any more than conservatives can take it back to the 50s. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you.